Hello and welcome to the Truths from the Stand Deer Hunting Podcast. I'm your host, Clint Campbell, and you're listening to episode number 57, brought to you by Wicked Tree Gear. Today we're bringing you another DIY report and talking, selecting a bow with the one and only bow hunting fiend, Greg Litzinger. So stay tuned. What is up, everybody? Happy Wednesday to you if you're listening to this on a Wednesday. Hopefully, in your neck of the woods, spring is starting to pop through. Here in Pennsylvania, it seems like we're still uh, in the clutches of of old man winter still just a little bit, but it looks like the forecast has a little bit of better weather coming our, coming our way. Uh, this past weekend, did get to get outside just a little bit and start to get you know, break the cabin fever, if you will and uh, do some archer shooting at the range and then also pop off some rounds with a shotgun with my with a couple buddies and, and my daughter getting her ready to go out for her youth uh, spring turkey opener. But uh, all signs are pointing, pointing towards spring and looking forward to getting after those those kings of spring here in the next few weeks. But uh, before we jump into this podcast, let's go ahead and ta- take a quick second to hear a word about our partners that continue to help us make this podcast possible. We are brought to you by Wicked Tree Gear, the longest, lastest, fastest cutting, toughest tree trimming equipment you have ever used. Simply put, the toughest saws on earth. How tough are they? Tough enough to come with a lifetime warranty. And right now, when you visit wickedtreegear.com, use the promo code TRUTH at checkout and get a 20% discount on your Wicked Tree Gear purchase. If you're not messing with Wicked Tree Gear, you are totally missing out. Hand saws, pole saws, they've got the Pro Blade coming out here soon, and of course, the bone saw. So do yourself a favor and head over to wickedtreegear.com and use that uh, promo code. We are also brought to you by Exodus Outdoor Gear. The new Exodus Trek is a byproduct of all the consumer voices who have been excited about what Exodus Trail cameras have to offer, but just can't fit a $200 camera into their budget, and that's okay. A budget-friendly camera backed by the industry's leading warranty is now here. The Trek comes in at a $145 price point and has the same proprietary shell, uh, design is the Lift Series camera, so you're getting the same quality construction, the same five-year warranty, and unmatched customer service policies you've you've come to know and love. A 0.7-second trigger speed, all the great photo, video, time-lapse, and hybrid modes that, that came or that you got used to with the Lift Series camera, and then, of course, a single-line backlit LED display for simple setup and use. And you also get about 20,000 images on a set of lithium batteries as well. If you'd like to learn more about the Exodus Trail cameras, check them out at exodusoutdoorgear.com or the partner link at the truth from this at, at the truth from the stand. Yeah, at truthfromthestand.com. And if you'd like what you see, uh, save yourself twenty dollars and use the promo code Truth at checkout. We are also brought to you by Tecamani Seed. Everything is bigger and better in Texas. No matter if you're in the South, Midwest, or the Northeast, Tecamani Food Plot Seed has your needs covered. Visit techamani.com and check out their product selector tool uh, to help you pick the right seed for your food plots. Use the promo code TRUTH at checkout and save 20%. We are also brought to you by Glacier Coolers, simply the world's finest. What other you're hunting, camping, fishing, maybe sitting out in your garage drinking beers, maybe having friends over for a birthday party. You'll enjoy the smarter design, stronger construction, and superior insulation of Glacier Coolers. Visit them at glaciercoolers.com. Promo code TRUTH at checkout and save yourself 20%. So we got a cool show for you today. Um, DIY Report is back. I know the first series we did was with Jeff Sturgis, kind of focusing on Habitat. This next series that we'll be kicking off today is with the bow hunting fiend, a.k.a. Greg Litzinger. Uh, you know, a, a lot of you probably follow his Instagram feed and know, you know, know of him as a dude that hunts, uh, hunts buck beds and uh, hunts public land, high pressure public land, uh, really knows his stuff whenever he gets into the public land woods, you know, whether he's hunting salt marshes or, or, or hilly terrain, the guy knows what's up. However, many of you probably don't know or maybe don't know as much that Greg is a hell of an archer. Um, he spent a, a fair amount of time in, in um, you know, as a as part of his early career, I guess, um, you know, tuning bows, setting up bows and helping people get into the right bows. He's actually done a lot for me in the past year in terms of helping me with some of the some of the technique issues I was having and some of you know the target panic you know if that's a word people use or not you know I know some people think say that it is target panic some people just you know don't kind of subscribe to that definition of it but 
regardless, I was having some challenges last year um, in, with my shooting technique and my overall accuracy and consistency. And I did a little bit of work with Greg um, for one day at the range, and he really kind of pulled my stuff together, just some really small tips that he gave me. Um, and so I thought with that, you know, if he was able to help me in that regard, I thought that maybe if we did a DIY report kind of focusing on things related to archery, archery technique, you know, selecting a bow, some of those common things that I think we maybe take for granted, um, you know, and don't really put a lot of thought into when we're either picking up a bow, shooting a bow or buying a bow. Um, I thought it'd be really cool to have Greg come on and kind of give his perspective as a guy who shoots competitively, has shot for a lot of years, who's gone through target panic and struggles of his own, you know, and has worked with a shooting coach. Um, you know, Greg has kind of been through the ringer, um, when it comes to shooting a bow. Um, so I thought he would be able to lend, uh, a lot of interesting advice, uh, tips, uh, techniques, and uh, just he's a hell of a dude. So I figured it'd be fun to do this series with him. So this first series or this first part of the mini series here, we're going to be focusing on the bow selection process. And without further ado, let's bring on the fiend. All right, we are live. Welcome back to another episode of the DIY Report slash Truth from the Stand Deer Hunting Podcast. And today we have uh, quite a treat for you. Mm. I, I'm yes. joined here live and in person with my my good friend Greg Litzinger. A lot of you know him as Bow Hunting Fiend. I think this is his second foray on to, uh, on the uh, podcast. But uh, what some of you might not know, if you're watching Greg's videos on, on on Instagram and following him, you know that the dude is a hardcore deer hunter, hunting buck beds, gets after it, public land, New Jersey, the Garden State. What some of you might not know about Greg is his uh, proficiency with a bow, not just in hunting scenarios, but in terms of target shooting, as well as his ability to set up a bow, tune a bow. Uh, in a past life, he worked in a pro shop. Yeah. Um, so whenever it comes to bows, he's a he's a gentleman I usually call first. When I did blow up a bow in one case that we were hunting, <laughs> we were shooting 3D together. Um, he saved my ass by getting my bow back in ship shape before I went to Montana. Um, so without further ado, Greg Litzinger, what's going on, my man? Yeah, what's happening, man? Hanging out, dude. You know, a, a day full of talking to you, talking bow hunting, and hitting the 3D course together to do some uh, some shooting together. Sounds good. It sounds good. Yeah. So here in this first part, uh, part one, this will be probably a four to five parter, you know, depending on how much ground we cover in each section. Um, and for those of you out there listening, this will be similar to what we did with Jeff Sturgis in terms of kind of building upon each section, some concepts for you to kind of take home for the week or two and kind of uh, apply them or think about them. And, and that's really the kind of the goal of the DIY, uh, uh, report, but here for part one, uh, what we're going to really be talking about initially here is selecting a bow. Cause everyone kind of has a different approach. And of course, you know, you should be shooting your bows and so forth, um, to see which one is going to work best for you. But you know, as a person who used to work with the general public and putting bows in people's hands and trying to make sure that they're getting the the right bow, you know, you know, I guess let's just start off with, you know, the, the axle to axle length, right? Because we hear a lot of different things, especially as like, you know, Matthews had their new bow come out, which was really, really short this year, right? And heard a lot of people saying, you know, of course, Levi Morgan shoots for them saying, how's a guy that's that tall going to shoot a bow that's that short axle to axle effectively and efficiently? My argument would be like the dude shoots lights it's out. He could probably, Morgan, yeah, yes. exactly. <laughs> but I've also worked. I've also shot with some other guys who had long draw lengths and were taller dudes recently that were shooting that bow and shot it lights out as well. They were good shots. Um, you know, so I'm just curious. You know, whenever we're talking axle to axle, how much should that play into consideration of, of their bow purchase? I, from speaking from, a, I would say, now this is all the disclaimer. This is not set in stone. This is just something that. This is I've, you working with the public saying yes. if you were going to, if someone came to you at a bow shop and said, I want to buy a new bow and they said, I'm based on me, yes. what would you, what would the pros and cons of axle to axle length be for me on the high end and on the low end? I'd ask them first, I would ask their draw length. Um, I'm not necessarily a long draw, but I'm 29 and I prefer a longer axle to axle because of, you know, string angle coming down into, you know, a full draw. I don't have to dip my head down into the string or I'm overdrawing to get my nose to hit the string. Um, but say somebody came in and they were like, I got, this is, this is how I hunt. I want this bow. And I measure a draw length and I say their draw length is 26, 27. I'd have no problem putting them in a short axle, axle bow. Mm -hmm. Not saying that, you know, that's needed or wanted, but the string angle for me, how I set up a bow and how I was, you know, taught and retaught as I got older is 
you want your head, spine, everything to be in a nice T form. You don't have to dip your head down. Not saying that it can't be done, but dipping your head down kind of changes, you know, the dynamics of shooting mm -hmm. in high stress situations. Everybody can shoot a bow well in flip flops, you know, in, in a, a controlled range. environment. Yes. Right. You, know, yeah. you, you add 140 inch deer or even a doe, whatever, you know, gets whatever you gets your rocks off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and if that bow is not on the plus side of being set up for you, you know, odds are you could make, you know, an <laughs> You can make a terrible shot in a deer, and that deer, in my opinion, the, the deer don't deserve it, and the hunter don't deserve to go through something like that. Right. So I prefer to set up a bow, be it 28-inch axle axle or 35-inch axle axle. That person pulls back, and they're pretty much anchored in the full draw position, nice square to the, you know, the old-school T-form, and go from there. Right. So for me, I know I have a short draw length, right? It's like a 26 and a half inch draw. And when I was shooting well, alligator my, arms, exactly. Tyrannosaurus Rex, right. you know, look awkward, <laughs> feel awkward. Thanks for reminding me. Um, the, uh, I shot a, a bow that was 30 inches axle to axle recently, uh, or previously this year. Now I'm shooting the obsession fixation and I have it. It's 32 inches axle to axle. And I will say that I'm more comfortable with the string angle. It took me the better part of like a year to get to get used to that string angle of that shorter bow. And I was shooting a five inch brace height, you know, so it's like that combined with the short axle yeah. axle, the string angle was pretty severe and I, and it was challenging to get used to because I went from something that was roughly, I think 31, my previous yeah. bow was, if I'm not mistaken, and it was a seven inch brace height. Yes. So it was a big change. Now this year I went the other way where now I'm shooting 32 inches axle to axle and I'm, I'm shooting a six inch brace height. And so my string angle is better. So my head placement feels better. I'm able to anchor a little bit better. And nice. I got used to this bow in a matter of weeks, as opposed to taking me like a calendar year yes. to, to, to get used to and, it. And with the string angle it, with today's modern cams, axle axles, it's a little, it's like, uh, like I said, the, the Matthews at 28 inch axle, it's what 28 inch to try. Yeah. Yeah. But those cams are monsters. So, that axle to axle 28 is not true a 28. That's where the axle is, but those cams are so large. The bow is actually a lot bigger at full draw. The, the string angle, the way the cams are designed and mm -hmm. the limb flex and everything. So the string angle isn't as extreme. So someone that's a long draw can shoot that bow more comfortably mm -hmm. than, you know, say a bow that was, you know, manufactured six, seven years ago. String angles, it's, it's really important. But as technology has gotten better, companies have been aware, you know, and have, I remember seeing PSE the videos I mean, years ago, you know, uh, and them going against Hoyt about string angles on them shorter bows. Right. And Hoyt changed their things around. Like everybody's kind of. You can evolving. start to fudge some yes. things based on some new technology. Yeah, practices. cam design has a lot to do with you right. know, uh, full draw position, how the cam is, the profile of the cam. And so the 20 inch, a true 20 inch axle axle manufactured now is definitely not what it was even, you know, five or six years ago. Right. So, so the other thing that a lot of people kind of look at whenever they're starting to think about a, a bow, and this might get a little bit more into setup, but, you know, if you're buying a high end bow to a degree, it's like you're buying, you know, a bow that's going to come specifically with limbs rated for certain poundage, right? Yes. It's like you can buy a starter bow and you can have some flexibility yes. and have a broader range of poundage that you can shoot. But if you're buying one of the more top end bows, it's like you're going to get limbs that are, you know, 60 pounds. to 65 pound yeah. limbs or 60 to 70 pound limbs yes. or whatever the case is, right? Premium bows will be kind of set because once you start changing, you know, the limb pockets, the, you're getting a lot of flex, change the, the, the dynamics of the bow, like how it you know, operates, how it was designed to operate. They're good for lower poundage, but like so you start getting to 70 pounds, just buy a 70 pound bow, 60, 70. Right. You know, if you're, you know, if it's a family bow, that's one thing, you know, if right. you're you plan on giving it to your son, like that's cool. But you know, uh, someone there's plenty of bows in that price point. Mm -hmm. You know that you you can get a bow that's you know 15 pound range mm -hmm. without getting a lot of you know because the more that it, those limb pockets you know are off the riser, you can start getting some bearances, some limb twists, and some uh, pocket twists, right. and that can cause some inaccuracies. The average person probably won't notice, right. but it could you know play into a factor, like I said, in a stressful situation where. You, you got a little bit of weight, you know, a little bit of fl more flex than was designed and the buck's coming at you and you just torque that grip a little bit. Well, the torque induced from the grip and then, you know, that changes how the, the limb might twist. And next thing you know, you're shooting, you know, six inches left and possibly a liver shot or a miss or right. know, something along those lines. I bet, too. I mean, I think, you know, I think one of the 
challenges too when folks are looking to get a bow, right? Because especially guys, right? Because we're kind of macho <laughs> peckerheads, you know what I mean? So for lack of a better way to put it, right? So they come in, it's like, I don't want a 70-pound bow. They feel like they got to shoot 70 pounds. Yeah. And so even if they're starting or they're, or they're relatively new, right? It's like, but I'm assuming, and I don't know this, I'm just kind of making a semi-educated assumption or a guess is that if you're picking up a, a, a new bow, you should be more interested in getting the right axle to axle, draw length, and poundage that's going to be comfortable for you versus making you get swole, yep. right? Yes. So, I mean, your recommendation, like if I come in and I say, you know, I'm, I'm five, whatever I am, five, eight, 26 and a half inch draw length, right? And I was like, hey, dude, I want to shoot a 70 pound pound draw, unless I've been shooting that consistently, right? Yes. You know, how would you kind of... If you're off the street and just getting an archery, I don't think that's a very wise decision personally. Mm -hmm. um, something an old timer taught me years ago, have them sit on the floor, butt on the ground, nothing against their back, and have them draw that bow back. If they can't draw that bow back level, too much bow form. Right. Because archery muscles, it's not, you can go to gym all day long. I mean, you can lift, you can bench 500 pounds, 600 pounds, but shooting a bow is different muscles. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not necessarily a, a big man by any means, but I can pull back an 80 pound compound. There's a guy three times my size who can't pull it back because there's technique involved to it. And I've been doing yep. it for 30 years. There's just ar right. there's archery muscles, you know, and yep. then there's not. So get a bow that you can pull back comfortably. Like we were talking earlier in a controlled environment, it's easy to pull back a bow. You know, it's, it's real easy. But when you start adding your cold, you're sitting still for a long time or your stressful situation, you know, you have bucks coming at your drones pumping. The last thing you need to do is struggle to get that bow back. Right. Or, you know, sky draw and you can't pull back smooth. Like sometimes, I mean, I've shot deer. They're looking right at me, but I shoot, you know, 50 for years. I shot 52 pounds. I blew through every, you know, six, seven, eight deer, like it's nothing, but I can, I could have pulled that bow back, literally looking at that deer, you know, and pull it back in a nice consistent manner. That deer don't really, he sees something's up or she sees something up, but I can pull back so slow and controlled and anchor like nothing's happened. Mm -hmm. That's nice, slow controlled draw sometimes is necessary and high poundage or real aggressive cams can kind of take away from that. Right, and I can shoot an aggressive cam, but I shoot less poundage. When I shoot, if I got a, a speed bow, I'll shoot sixty pounds, you mm -hmm. know, or fifty-five pounds, because I'm making up that you know power difference because right. of the cam, aggressive cam. But right. a lot of people said I I need to shoot seventy. Why? And they can't give an answer because because that's what I need to do. That doesn't make any sense. Right. <laughs> I, to, to this day, I'm like, oh, I don't. Okay, I guess is it legal? Are you going to call hippos or something? Yeah. <laughs> right. Going to Africa? Yeah. You got to shoot a certain weight, but. Right. We shoot your white tails there. Well, there's a reason that kids only have to pull back 35 pounds to, or anyone, I shouldn't yes. say kids, anybody needs, yeah. in Pennsylvania, you have to pull back 35 pounds before you can yeah. legally hunt with a compound, right? And there's a reason for that. It's yeah. because 35 pounds is what it takes to ethically kill yeah. a white tail. Yes. Now, would I take a 40 yard shot at 35 pounds? No. Probably not, right? And most hunters, I don't care what, what site they have or what YouTube videos they watch or magazines they read. The average eastern, northeastern whitetail hunter, it's hard to get a 40 yard shot. I mean, I've killed. Oh, there's so much stuff in the middle between you and them. I yeah. mean, it's not I've like killed. there's just you and Aaron opportunity between yeah. the two of you. You know you what know, I mean? I've killed one deer past 40. I get 138, 143. I don't, and, and both of those were yeah. shot with 56 pounds, and I blew through both of them like it was nothing. <laughs> yeah. You don't need 70 pounds. You know? <laughs> right, exactly. So we, we talked a little bit already about string angle, but I want to talk some about specifically you know brace height right because there's all this i think so it was eye-opening for me when i started really kind of researching a couple years like two or three years ago when i was really starting to go okay i want to better understand what the hell's going on with my equipment and better understand how it's going to fit me and help me right and that was when i started kind of investigating string angle to understand what it really meant because for the longest time all you ever hear is oh the, this the, or i'm not sorry not string angle but brace height the the smaller the brace or the shorter the brace height the less accurate or the more touchy the bow is. Yeah. There's a nugget of truth to that, I feel like, but then there is, but it's also dependent on the person that's shooting it and their draw length to begin with, because there's, there's your brace height, there's your draw length, and then there's your power stroke. Right. right? So for 
everyone out there listening kind of like walk through what brace height really means in relationship to your draw length, your power stroke, and accuracy. Before we continue our conversation, let's talk about Wicked Tree Gear saws. Hardcore deer hunters need tools that can keep up. We don't baby our gear and take on whatever Mother Nature happens to be dishing out that day in the tree stand. Check out Wicked Tree Gear hand saws and pull saws at wickedtreegear.com. Use the promo code TRUTH to save yourself 20% on the next purchase with free ground shipping and get a saw that's tough enough to work as hard as you hunt. And now back to the show. Brace height for me, how I interpret it, I don't, maybe an engineer or a uh, uh, someone with a lot more archery background, <laughs> but I have a different interpretation. But brace height is literally from the string to the the third of the grip. Now, six inches, five inches, and seven inches. There's really not much difference. Two inches, like how bad can it be? Right. From my personal experience, someone with a thirty inch draw length should shy away from a five inch brace height belt. And here's my interpretation of it. In summertime, it's fine. It works. You got no t-shirt on, long sleeve. But as soon as you put a heavy jacket on, you got this big thing on your forearm. That string is pretty much right in the meat part of your forearm. You know, mm-hmm. so if you got a jacket puffing out, you know, it's it could lead to um, string you know, slapping your slapping your arm, which gets you know noisy and it, it throws the arrow offline. Now, someone in your case, the twenty-six inch drawling, you can shoot a five-inch brace height bow. And get the same clearance as me shooting a seven inch at mm-hmm. 29 inch, you know, uh, brace height. Right. And if you look at archery, is all about accuracy. Speed is it's what we've been sold. Speed is nice. Don't get me wrong. Speed's been a great marketing tool. Exactly. Yeah. It sells. Yep. You know, it's like sex. Sex sells. Yeah. I mean, if, if you could put if you could put like a bow and yep. put some naked naked people on a bow, yep. it's like it's and then some people the short draw archers, it's great. Brace height is a fantastic thing. But someone's got a 30 inch draw length. You can, you don't need to shoot that. Like, and some people are speed freaks. That's fine. You know, but for me, I'm an accuracy freak. I don't care how fast your bow shoots. I mean, I want to be able to pull back my bow and under any situations, you know, adrenaline or non-adrenaline and be able to hit, you know, whatever I'm aiming at, be it 20 yards, 30 yards, 40 yards, even up to 90 yards, whatever it might be. I mean, you look at professional archers that shoot a bow for a living for accuracy. None of them are shooting five inch brace height bows. Right. You know, that got a long draw. Some of the yeah. short draw guys and women, yes. Right. But, you know, the Levi Morgans of the world, Jeff Hopkins, all these guys, like, they're shooting accurate bows because that's right. what wins that. That's what puts the deer on the wall. That put, puts meat in the freezer. Speed yep. doesn't do that. Accuracy does that. Right. So, Brace Sight, as I said, it's a good marketing tool. It gets a lot of people up and revving. And I've shot them. It's cool to shoot a bow, you know, 370 feet per second. It's awesome, you know, an yeah. IBO bow. It's cool. It's neat. It's fast, but. You know, I mean, I compete, and my bow is 305 feet per second, but there's a trade-off to that. It, it, there's vibration in the bow. I got a real mm-hmm. light arrow. So there's a lot that goes into, you know. Good, what brace height you're going to choose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the one way that I kind of, like, learn, learned it was exactly what you were saying. But then also, whenever you were saying, like, for, you wouldn't have a problem putting a shorter brace or a shorter draw length guy in a, in a shorter brace yeah. height. And part of that is is that, you know, if I have a 26 and a half inch draw. If I shoot a five inch brace height, this is going to be bags so my math. That's a 21 and a half inch power stroke. You know what I mean? So you shooting at 29, if you shoot a six inch brace height, you still have a 23 inch power stroke. Yes. So you still have a larger power stroke yeah. than I do at six inches. Go to seven inch brace height and you have a 22 inch power stroke, which means now you have an inch more power stroke than me still shooting a seven inch brace height. Which means now your your arrow is actually on the string less amount of time, which means it has less time for your human error Correct. to take to impact that arrow before Correct. it leaves the string. Exactly. So a guy with a longer draw length, when he's shooting at a shorter brace height, he's actually leaving the arrow on the string longer. So yes, he's that's how he's getting more of that speed. Yeah. Right. Exactly. But he's also leaving himself a, a a smaller margin for error because his his arrow is staying on that string for yes. an extended period of time. Yes. And uh, here's a quick interpretation of brace hikes i never really knew what i never really tested i shot it as an old elite xlr i think they're eight and a half inch brace height bow thing was slow but accurate i mean i used it for hunting one year because i built it for three days too slow so i used it for for a winter bow and i had a you know 400 grain arrow and i could literally torque that grip i mean pretty hard to the right and i could still hit a deer at vital at 
30 yards. It was mind boggling. Wow. And I had another bow. It was a uh, six inch brace height, same arrow, same weight, same poundage. And if I did the same type of torquing, you know, I would hit that deer in the guts. And that was like my own, the only testing I've ever really done on brace height from right. eight and a half to six inch. There is a noticeable difference. It was, you know, granted the, the elite was a lot slower. So that, you know, mm-hmm. helps out. But the brace height, you know, that bow was just accurate. No matter what I did, torque, you know, up, down, left, right, that thing would still, you know, mm-hmm. the shot would be, you know, a kill shot on a white tilt at right. 30 yards. 40, 50, 60, yeah, it would be drift a lot more. But the average shot, I mean, 30 yards is a far shot for a lot of people. You know, right. and it was like, wow, that's still kill deer. But my little speed bow do the same thing. I mean, that's a straight gut shot. So it was like, right. it's not scientific data, but that is me trying to put the same amount of stress on right. the on the grip and grant the grip design has a lot to do with it but when the elite broke it broke clean you know mm. no, the bow didn't kick this way but that little speed bow just that little bit of torque and that bow would just felt different you know with you know whip hard to the right and you know the arrow you know go you know way left yeah i mean and that's where that's where you get when you hear guys or girls say you know a, a shorter axle to axle bow and a short brace height bow is a touchy bow and part of that is is just because you know, especially from the brace height perspective, is that you just have that arrow on that string longer. So if you are torquing at all, yeah. you know, it's going to. So just imagine, like, take you know, one test that you can do is take a pencil, right, and just take it between your fingers up and down, and just roll your fingers back and forth and watch how it yeah. moves left and right, right. Exactly. Now take a ruler that's twelve inches long or a yardstick, and do the same thing and watch the ends of it and see how much it moves. That shorter one takes a lot less movement of your fingers to make a larger movement at each end of that. So it's the same same kind of concept. I don't know what physics term that is. There's probably yeah. some scientist somewhere that could I'm scratch their head, going, "What are these guys? What the hell is that guy talking about?" about? <laughs> exactly. Um, Doesn't make any sense. <laughs> we we talk about a lot of things on this podcast that don't make sense. This is just one of very one of the many. <laughs> the uh, so the, the last point here that I want to talk about, and you started touching on it a little, a little bit, was uh, is speed versus a slower bow, right? So you know, I know, like you mentioned, you're looking for an accurate bow, um, which is you know obviously what we all kind of want when we're when we're archery hunting, whether you're, t- whether you're target shooting. Um, but is there an instance where you would put someone in a speed bow? Because for me, personal experience, it's like I've gone for a, a speed bow typically because I do have a short draw length, right? And I still need to at some point and connect, get some kinetic energy downrange. And I know kinetic energy, you know, is is a combination of like your bow's ability to provide the speed that it needs, but it's also the weight of your arrow, yes. the composition of your arrow, your front of center, and like all those things. And we'll get into those things as we get into some of these other um, these other archery podcasts that we're going to do part of this mini series. But you know, I guess talk to me just a little bit about like when would you suggest a speed bow to somebody versus a slower bow, and then and vice versa. For me, it would pretty much have to do with um, what the bow is going to be used for. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of guys that are, say, going out west, going elk hunting or you know, antelope hunting, and they got to potentially poke something that might be 50, 60, 70 yards, then I would try to maybe push them into a little bit faster bow. Mm-hmm. As you said, to get penetration at that distance on an animal, you, you need a little more oomph behind it. You know I mean, right. granted, arrow weight has a lot to do with it, but, but speed... Because the average person isn't going to want to shoot a 500 grain arrow. They right. give them that power at that distance, you right. know, and, and speed still sells. Right. Um, I've sold a lot of guys with speed bows and have them come back in a year and buy a slow bow because they don't like it. Right. You know, there's a lot to it. So I ask them what their intentions are with the bow. Like, what are they planning on doing it? Do you, are they uh, looking to you know, get something out of that? Some guys, they want speed just because... You know, it's what's been forced down their throat by a magazine. So right. I'll sell them speed bow. Your money, not mine. You right. know, right. I would advise this. Your long draw, you're, you're a decent shot. You know, I mean, yeah, all right. You know, we go in this range. But if you're a newbie, I try to shy away from a speed bow. And my, what I would tell customers is, all right, you put me <laughs> and Mario Andretti right. in, in, in the, you know, Two Ford Focuses, you know, he's going to outdrive me because right. he has talent. You, right. know, you put me and him in a Ferrari, he's going to outdrive me because he has talent. So right. it doesn't really matter, you know, that I can't drive. I'm not a race car driver, so I can't, you know, get in a race car. And faster get, bows are going to make you a better hunter exactly. or a better shot. Exactly. A faster bow is just going to get get your inaccurate shot yeah, or great shot there more 
more and, quickly. And speed bows can be frustrating for a lot of people. I mean, my buddy, he bought an obsession a few years ago. I told him to buy, I think it was the Phoenix, time mm-hmm. at seven and a quarter or whatever it was. Right. It's a great bow. He had to buy their speed bow. Well, you know what? That obsession's collecting dust now because he can't shoot it. Right. He, he doesn't have the technique the slower for one. Yes, he don't yeah. have the technique for it. You know, he's a finger he he's a finger popper. Mm-hmm. Uh, he grips the bow and he torques the bow. So, you know, there's a, a lot of variables come into play when selecting, you know, a, a good hunting bow. Right. And a lot of shops, pro shops, big box stores, just because something's a pro shop doesn't necessarily mean they're a pro. Their right. job is to sell. Right. And the speed bow will sell a lot faster. Right. And odds are you're going to come back and probably buy, buy another bow from them. Right. And that's a sad world we live in, but that is the, the reality of it. Know. So the moral of the story there is just, you know, before you go out and buy a bow, it's almost like anything else in this world today. You have the Google box. Yeah. Do your research, exactly. figure out what's going to work best for you, understand what your what application you're going to most use it for, you know, because sure, it's like I could have a slower bow, right, if I were going to shoot spots, yeah. right, because I go to the range and I shoot pretty well, well at the range, you know, for a guy who's mainly a hunter and I shoot for that purpose, you know what I mean? But if I were going to spot shoot all day, I'd probably, I probably would get a slower yeah. bow, you know what More I mean? More accurate bow, longer yeah. axle to axle, the things that's going to take up some of your uh, inconsistencies. And right. Like I said, and, and I said, this is all just me working in shops and me shooting and tuning. There's guys out there that can shoot a 32 inch straw that want a five inch brace height bow. I don't know why, but they can shoot it very well. And there's mm-hmm. guys that are probably getting paid by archery companies that can shoot it. And there's, they're the anomalies. You have to take, right. you have to take the, I guess the, the extremists on both ends, take them out of the equation and kind of go with, you know, the middle, yeah. middle ground. Because exactly. there's, People that are terrible shots, no matter what bow you put in your hands. There's right. people that are great shots, no matter what, what whatever bow they have. So right. you have to get rid of those and kind of work with people in the middle. You right. know, and ask the average person, consumer, ask your buddy, or even visit a few pro shops and big box stores, whatever, and just talk before you make a purchase because it's right. a large purchase. You know, a five hundred dollar bow, you got another you know three four dollars in accessories. Dress it up. There's a yeah. grand. Yep. I don't know about you. I don't have a thousand dollars to spend every year. Some people do. Right. Hey, rock on. Right. Good for, <laughs> good for you, man. You're doing something. Maybe right. one day I'll be there. But, um, but yeah. it's finding a bow that fits, grip, you know, string angle, what you like, and it, it's trial and error. Right. You know, I've, I've, I mean, at one point in time, I had like eight bows, all different shapes and sizes. I'm um, still because I just got into 3D, got into Target, had a little bit of spare money, so I bought a bunch of used bows. I bought every kind of bow. You know, limb stops, cable stops, um, long, short, you know, long brace sights, short brace sights. And after a while, I figured out for me personally, I shoot a 34 to 36 inch axle axle bow extremely well, seven inch brace sight. Don't matter if it's a limb stop, cable stop. Right. You know, my new breed is 34 and a half, 34 and a quarter, six and seven inch brace. I think it shoots lights out for me. Right. You know, and. Yep. That's just trial and error. You know, spend a lot of money. <laughs> right. I mean, I think the other thing that you're kind of mentioning here is too, is that, you know, before you go buy something, it's like, go just like the most important thing is that you're comfortable with yes. it. So spend time and, and go to the stores and shoot and shoot as many bows as you can possibly get your hands on. I know it's like in the past two years, it's like, I, I don't even know how many bows I've shot. Mm-hmm. Like just trying to find what type of bow was going to work for mm-hmm. me. It so happened, you know, I got to shoot the new obsession whenever I went to ATA cause I couldn't, it was hard for me to find a dealer around here. So I couldn't shoot them. Finally went and shot them. And it was like, it was one of those things where you, you shoot it and it was like, Oh yeah, this is what I wanted it to yeah. feel like. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was, and I'd shot, you know, and look, the thing is nowadays is like all these different bow manufacturers, they all make a good bow. Exactly. There's not, I mean, it, it just comes down. They're all make, they all make some form of, of speed bow for the most part. Right. They all make some short sort of long axle or short axle to a degree with, mm-hmm. For their brand, whatever yeah, short and long share, is, they right? Get their market share, and and they all have, I won't say similar, but like technology in terms of like cams and risers mm-hmm. and stuff can only go so far, right? So it's not like there's this huge disparity between this company's cam technology and this company's cam yeah. technology. You know what I mean? So it's like you're getting, I mean, you're talking about a very small envelope of difference between them. So it really just comes down to like go shoot the bow, see which ones you like, whenever it feels right. Don't give a shit whether it's a short. Yeah. a long a short brace height a long brace height like whatever it is if it felt right and you could shoot it buy it yeah. you know and, what I mean and then don't blow it up yeah <laughs> and, uh, the, the touch on that again is 
also when you when you buy you go to you shoot a couple new bows and you come from a different bow a slower bow odds are you're going to shoot this new bow extremely well because it's a new toy Mm -hmm. and if you have terrible form or habits you're going to come leave that range in two or three weeks you're going to shoot that bow as well as shot your last bow because it's not new the the shininess wore off and you know old habits die hard comes Mm -hmm. uh, comes in so you might think it's the greatest bow and it's amazing and then a month later you hate it right like my buddy with that obsession yeah he shot i mean lights out store within a month he hated hated shooting he, he didn't even hunt that one year you know because right. he was so frustrated he got so mentally frustrated because of that bow right because you know it wasn't designed for him right you know so just because it's good in the store doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be good in the range also and that right. that i hate saying that but sometimes that's what happens you know? yeah because i you definitely you're more hyper focused when you have a new bow and yes. so you're really focused on making sure your technique's correct because you are conscious that it's a new bow yes so it's like i need to make sure that and i'm also doing... you're there in a store and hey say guys and women are notorious for they put their best face forward mm-hmm. you know and everybody's around i'm gonna be great and yep. you go home by yourself and it falls to the wayside. Right. Yep. Exactly. All right. Awesome, man. Well, I think we got a lot of good info here for, you know, guys out there or girls out there that are looking at, you know, a new bow purchase. You know, this, of course, as Greg had mentioned, is not the end all be all checklist of things you should consider when going through a bow. But these are just some things that he and I, you know, him specifically kind of looks at because he's put people in bows before and some of the questions he asks them. Um, you know, I think the moral of the story is, is shoot bows when you find one you like, buy it. Don't blow it up. Don't be brand specific either. Yeah. So many people are brands. I need to shoot this X brand, Y brand, Z brand. Shoot them all. Yep. I've 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 owned them all. I, at one point in time, I've had eight different, seven different bow manufacturers sitting in my house. Seven different brands of bows at my house at the same time, and I shot them all well. I shot some a lot better than others. So, yep. That was trial and error and expensive right. lesson, but now I know what I look for in a grip. You know, a lot of it, you know, grip, you know, in a bow, grip's very important. And if it's not broke, don't fix it. Exactly. Right. Right. Awesome. Thanks for coming on, man. No problem. All right, folks, as a wrap for today's show, we'd like to thank Greg for joining and be sure to check him out on Instagram and give him a follow for all kinds of scouting and archery videos. You can find him at the bow hunting fiend on Instagram. We'd, of course, like to thank all of you for listening, and if you haven't, please head over to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating, and be sure to subscribe to the podcast. We'd be super appreciative of your support there. And before we shut this thing down, we need to give a big shout-out to our partners that continue to help us make this podcast possible. Wicked Tree Gear, Exodus Outdoor Gear, Trophy Ridge, Ozonics, Obsession Bows, Tecamani Seed, Glacier Coolers, Ramcat Broadheads, and Trophy Taker Rests. And until next time, we'll see y'all. Makes me proud, makes me steal. I could show you through the door. I ain't welcome anymore. Long time coming, if at all. It takes a special knowing to call a fall. Damaged heads, broken letters. Rationalize yourself in numbers. But I...